Welcome to the eighth of eight sessions on advanced concepts in pediatric TB sponsored by the Southeastern National TB Center. Today we present advanced concepts in pediatric TB pharmacotherapeutics of TB drugs. Today's presenter is Dr. Charles Pelliquin. Prior to coming to the University of Florida, Pelliquin completed a hospital pharmacy residen residency at Duke University Medical Center, where he also served on the clinical staff. Pelliquin completed a fellowship in infectious diseases and pharmacokinetics at the Clinical Pharmacokinetics Laboratory, Millard Phil Fillmore Hospital, Buffalo, New York. For 20 years, he was the director of the Infectious Disease Pharmacokinetics Laboratory at National Jewish Medical and Research Center, Denver, Colorado. He now serves as professor of pharmacy and medicine at UF, where the IDPL is now located. Pelican and his lab are part of the UF Emerging Pathogens Institute. He also is a consultant to the FDA and CDC. Thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome to the webinar. And today we're going to focus on pediatric patients and the use of drugs for patients who have tuberculosis. The objectives will be to look at the general principles of antimicrobial use sometimes overlooked in the treatment of tuberculosis, as well as the pharmacokinetic principles, monitoring for toxicity, the spectrum of activity of these drugs, how they work, though I'm not going to stress a lot of the details for mechanism of action, routes of administration, adverse effects, and so on. And then we'll talk a little bit about therapeutic drug monitoring that may have a role in some patients that you will see. Now this is the list of drugs that we have at our disposal, and you can see it's a pretty short list of drugs that are actually approved for the treatment of tuberculosis. For those of you following the NBA Finals, you might say that rifampin is the LeBron James of TB drugs. Uh, you might be a Golden State Warrior fan, and, and then you'd say it's a Seth Curry kind of drug, but at any rate, rifampin is the most important drug. An alternative to rifampin is rifapentine, which is much more studied in adults than it is in children. And then we have other drugs, including isoniazid, that are very important, pyrazinamide, that is very important. And then the rest of them are essentially role players that have a particular role, especially in drug-resistant cases. Among other drugs that we might choose to use for the treatment of tuberculosis are drugs that are not actually approved by the FDA for that indication. Now that's not necessarily a problem. If you have a rationale for using the drug, you certainly may use the drug to treat your patient. Nevertheless, if you went to the package insert, you would not see some lengthy approval discussion for tuberculosis. Other aminoglycosides besides streptomycin that we might choose include amikacin or canamycin. And Amikacin is probably the one that most people use. It's readily available. You can get assays measured at most local hospitals, so that's probably the most convenient. Among the fluoroquinolones currently available, moxifloxacin and levofloxacin are the preferred agents for the treatment of tuberculosis. There is no head-to-head -head study that shows that one is definitively better than the other, uh, at least in long-term treatment. So at this point, it's a choice, and we can talk about why you might pick one versus the other. Other drugs that we could consider but are not labeled for TB and may or may not have a big role include the macrolids, azithromycin and clarithromycin. These are indicated for Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC, but they're not indicated for tuberculosis. At least in vitro, they're very weak drugs against TB. Whether or not in vivo they have more activity is something that's being studied right now. Beta-lactams, including amoxicillin clavulanic, have been used kind of on a desperation basis for extremely drug-resistant cases of tuberculosis, but the role is clearly not established, and there's no prospective randomized study to compare um, amoxicillin clavulanic acid versus any other comparator. Clofazamine is a leprosy drug that's being reevaluated for tuberculosis. Initially, it was developed as a TB drug, but it was kind of a washout uh, at that time. But people have circled back, and there are some advantages of the drug, and it remains to be seen on a clinical basis just how important those advantages might be. The one main advantage is that it's still active even in the presence of rifampin and isoniazid resistance, so it definitely has that going for it. 
Rifabutin is an alternative to either rifapentine or rifampin, and we'll talk further about exactly where it fits in. Right now it's indicated for the treatment of MAC, but it's also used for the treatment of tuberculosis, and it is listed in the TB guidelines. Linazolid and the newer oxazolidinones, sutazolid and AZD5847 are all in the same class. Linazolid is the only one of these three that's on the market. It has be, been used for MDR-TB, which is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Again, as a minimum, resistant to isoniazid and to rifampin. So linazolid has a role, especially for XDR-TB, where you add resistance to quinolones and add resistance to an injectable. So once you get to that stage of drug resistance, you're really quickly running out of classes of drugs. And it's in those kinds of patients that linazolid seems to have a role. The precise dose, however, has not been worked out. Now, a few comments about pediatric cases of any disease state, and in particular here, tuberculosis. So as a caveat, I will say I'm not a pediatric specialist. I have been involved in the care of many children, but per se, I'm not a pediatric specialist. Uh, there are some great papers by colleagues, Greg Kearns and Susan Abdel-Rahman, and you're welcome to look up those papers, and they have really good discussions about the caveats of treating children. I'll try to do it justice here, and so let's, let's proceed. Uh, small children, as you already know, if you have children of your own, they can't swallow adult dosage forms. And various uh, pharmacists, nurses, uh, physicians, and parents come up with all kinds of wily ways to get the children to take the drugs. Crush them up, or you open the capsules, and you mix it into whatever food the child likes. Uh, one of my favorite techniques is chocolate pudding, especially sugar-free chocolate pudding. Uh, almost every child likes that, so you're likely to get it into the child. But it's important to realize that once they swallow it, we don't have any data on the absorption from those dosage forms. It just gets into the kid. And these dosage forms may not be stable for storage. So it's not like you can make a week's worth of uh, chocolate pudding dosage forms and just keep them on the counter. I would definitely not recommend that you do that. Next, children uh, change over the course of time, and you already knew that, but besides the obvious change in weight and height, inside the total body of water is changing, and it's highest in infants and it decreases over the first few years of life. So in other words, the kids are drying out. Well, who cares? Well, you should care from the standpoint that some of the drugs really like to distribute to where the water is. So if there's less water, there's going to be more hanging in the blood, which of course is a lot of water. Uh, on the other hand, if you're looking at a smaller child with a lot of total body water, the aminoglycosides, the amphetol, cycloserine, and to a lesser extent isoniazid are going to go to those areas where the water is within the tissue spaces, and so the plasma concentrations are likely to be less. Over the first 6 to 12 months, the renal function of an infant changes, and they become more adult-like, and then they actually exceed the renal function of adults. So renally cleared drugs, again, some of these water-soluble drugs, aminoglycosides, ethambitol, and cycloserine, are drugs you really need to be careful with when you're treating small children. So you have two problems. You have drug distributing into more places, but it also might be cleared more slowly. And then you have a third problem for the two oral drugs, ethambitol and cycloserine, of getting the drug into the child in the first place. So this is not really a trivial undertaking. Total body clearance, which is the sum of the renal clearance and the hepatic clearance, uh, is often faster in children than in adults. So if you give an equivalent dose based on weight only, on a milligram per kilogram basis, you generally are going to have lower plasma concentrations in children than in adults. And sometimes you might need twice the dose in the child to get concentrations that you see in the adult. Combining the previous listed factors, it typically means that children need higher milligram per kilogram doses than adults after the first year of life. There are U.S. guidelines, there's WHO, there's WHO guidelines, and other guidelines out there. The doses are similar, but they're not identical. 
And so uh, depending on what your personal favorite guideline is, the doses that are going to be coming up in the subsequent slide may be similar but not identical to the uh, doses that you're familiar with from your favorite guideline. Okay. So here we go with specifics on the drugs. And if you've heard other webinars that I've given, you might have seen slides very much like these here, and that's because the drugs really haven't changed for the most part since the 1950s and 1960s. We pretty much have now what we had then with a couple of exceptions. So isoniazid, as mentioned, is one of the primary drugs along with rifampin for treating what we call drug susceptible uh, TB. So let's stop and take a look at what we mean by drug susceptible. It means that you've isolated the organism from the patient, uh, that sample is worked up in the laboratory and it's tested against concentrations of various antimicrobials and it shows activity at a particular concentration that's achievable in the patient. If the concentration cannot be achieved in the patient, then you would consider that organism resistant to that drug. That has implications not only on the susceptibility testing end of it, but also on the drug delivery end of it, and we'll come to that late in the presentation. So isoniazid has the advantage of being given orally, intramuscularly, or intravenously as a slow five-minute bolus in about five, 25 milliliters of normal saline for an adult dose and proportionally less for a pediatric dose. The standard dose is 300 milligrams, and I think you'll find in the upcoming release of the new ATS, CDC, IDSA treatment guidelines, um, and I, I think I'm leaving out one of the groups that's affiliated, but you know, the national guidelines for the treatment of TB, the maximum word, the maximum dose designation is going to be removed from uh, those guidelines. Now that our population is getting larger and larger, and there's in some cases an obesity epidemic, and that does extend into the pediatric world, then putting maximum doses may deprive these larger patients of the amount of dose they actually need. So that's just a caveat to keep in mind. For children, usually it's in the 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram. And I'll just point out this 15 milligrams per kilogram is going to be a recurring theme for many, but importantly, not all of the TB drugs. Isoniazid is cleared by the liver by an enzyme that shows uh, genetic polymorphisms. So you have fast metabolizers and you have slow metabolizers, and that might be an important clinical uh, point, especially for regimens that are not daily. If you're three times a week or twice a week, that might become an important variable. Some would argue even on daily dosing it's an important variable. The toxicities associated with isoniazid, including toxicity to the liver or peripheral neuropathy, sometimes central neuropathy. Happily, children seem to tolerate these drugs pretty well. Uh, Dr. Stark, I believe, has recorded another lecture in this series, and I would refer you to his discussion about how patients are treated uh, and how these children tolerate these drugs. Rifampin, I've already mentioned, is the key drug. It's the, the all-star for our team of TB drugs, and it's used primarily with isoniazid and some role players, if you will, uh, in the treatment of TB. It is given either orally or intravenously. The standard adult dose is 600 milligrams daily. And the pediatric dose, I would lean towards the 20 milligram per kilogram end of the rare for the adult. For several years, the standard dose of rifampin is going to change. It is cleared by the liver, but is not cleared by the cytochrome P450 system. It can produce either liver toxicity at a pretty low rate or a flu-like syndrome, especially if the patient is taking the drug intermittently. Uh, some studies a long time ago showed that if you gave very large doses once a week, like 1,800 milligrams once a week, after several months, uh, 10 to 20 percent of the patients would have this flu-like syndrome that would come and go after the dose of the drug. Uh, if you give it daily, you should not be seeing that. If you are seeing it and the patient is getting self-administered therapy, it's telling you that they're probably not taking it every day. Rifapentine is a derivative of rifampin. It's cyclopentyl rifampin. So it would be used instead of rifampin and not with rifampin. Just released by this 
uh, reference here at the bottom in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine this year, 2015. Uh, the new dose was seven days a week with food, 1,200 milligrams of rifampentine. And this dose here for children is probably now at the low end of the range because this study 29 here did not include children. So this dose may change upward in coming years. But right now, that's a ballpark estimate of a reasonable dose for children, and I'll have more in just a slide or two on that. So it'll be this slide right here. Study 26, and the last one was study 29X, but study 26 was for latent tuberculosis as opposed to active disease. So everybody was getting a once-weekly regimen as opposed to a daily regimen. But this study included kinetics and tolerability in children, and that was published in the Journal of Pediatric Infectious Diseases a year ago, June of 2014. And the punchlines from this story are a two-fold greater rifampentine dose for all children resulted in a 1.3-fold higher AUC. So we doubled the dose, but we barely, you know, got over 100%. We got 130% on average of the AUC seen in adults. So it looks like you have to double up the adult dose to get reasonably close exposure in children. It made a big difference whether they could swallow the whole tablets, which was better, or the crushed tablets, which was much more variable. So again, as pointed up at the beginning of this presentation, extemporaneous dosage forms might be necessary but you cannot expect them to deliver the same kind of concentrations consistently as you would get from a dosage form designed for children. Again, the other conclusion here, uses of higher weight-adjusted rifampentine doses for young children are warranted to get the exposures that are associated with successful treatment in adults. Rifabutin was mentioned earlier, and it's a drug that's actually approved for non-tuberculous mycobacteria, specifically M. avium complex, but it also is reasonably active against TB. It is not a one-to-one -one switch for rifampin, however, because it has some differences. We usually use it in cases of HIV-positive TB or in other cases where patients have complex medical situations and they're on a lot of other medications. Rifampin is a very potent enzyme inducer. Um, and it changes the pharmacokinetics of a lot of other drugs. Rifabutin does so, but much less. So that's the advantage of rifabutin. Standard adult doses are 300 milligrams daily, but there's a range even up to 600 milligrams daily. There's not good pediatric data for rifabutin, so we estimate, and it's purely an estimate, of five milligrams per kilogram. So this would be a drug that I would definitely consider therapeutic drug monitoring, because we really don't know if this dose is right but we have a really good idea of what the concentrations ought to be, and we'll talk about that shortly. It's also cleared by the liver, but the toxicity profile is different. It causes neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anterior uveitis. Now, generally, that's not site-threatening, but it's certainly irritating, and it's something to watch for. And this seems to be concentration-dependent. So rifabutin, if it's either overdosed or if it's given with other drugs that affect its clearance, because unlike rifampin, it is partially cleared by the cytochrome P450 system. So if you give a drug like ritonavir or you give a drug like cobacistat, it's going to block the clearance of rifabutin, and therefore you might run into a situation where you could have anterior uveitis. Uh, it was most clearly seen back in the 1990s before the uh, highly active antiretroviral era when patients who had disseminated MAC we're getting fluconazole and clarithromycin, two enzyme inhibitors, and those patients could run into problems with anterior uveitis. It's not that common, but it's something to watch for. So here's the comparative chart, both on the cytochrome P450 3A4 induction, and this enzyme is responsible for the clearance of about half of all the drugs that are cleared by the liver, so it's very important. And previously it was thought that rifampentin was less potent than rifampin, but rifampin was tested daily and rifampin was tested twice weekly. So it's not surprising that there was a difference. But now that we're dosing rifampin daily for active TB, it's at least as potent as rifampin. Um, the flu-like syndrome was talked about. I talked about these 
toxicities, which are different for rifabutin. And then rifapentine is very, very highly protein bound. In our laboratory, it's 99% protein bound. So that has implications because only the free drug, not the protein bound drug, is available to interact with mycobacteria. Pyrazinamide is the ninja of the TB drugs. It seems to act against a particular uh, group of the organisms that are slowly multiplying in an acidic media, media, such as certain portions of cavitary lesions. Now, in general, children don't have cavitary lesions, so it's a little less clear how important pyrazinamide is in the treatment of hyalur adenopathy, which is a more common manifestation in children. Nevertheless, we use it as part of the standard regimen, and the doses uh, for children are about 35 milligrams per kilogram. Now, the guidelines I do take some exception to because the guidelines even list as low as 15 milligrams per kilogram, which is a dose that I don't believe was ever studied. When the British Medical Research Council studied it, they studied in adults 35 milligrams per kilogram. And over time, people have dialed that dose down more or less empirically. And um, so we can call that into question. I think we may be underdosing, at least in adults, pyrazinamide. It's cleared by the liver, and then the metabolites go out in the kidneys. So if you have a patient on dialysis, we usually give it three times a week at the daily dose because these metabolites may or may not be the cause of this liver toxicity. Uric acid is very likely to be elevated in your patients. In fact, if you're doing self-administered treatment and their uric acid is normal, they're almost certainly not taking their pyrazinamide. If the ambitol is used as a fourth drug at the start of the regimen, so we start with four, just in case there's isoniazid-resistant organisms or possibly rifampin-resistant organisms um, in the patient that we're about to treat. It takes sometimes uh, many days, if not many weeks, to get your susceptibility data back. In children, it's often hard to get an organism at all, and you're based on uh, known contacts or best guess for the susceptibility in that patient. So if Ambitol is used until we're reasonably confident that the patient has fully drug susceptible TB. It's given orally in the US. In Europe, there's an IV dosage form, but generally speaking, we don't have it here. Uh, the dose is 15 to 25 megs per keg. But I would say, again, the British Medical Research Council studies looked at 25 megs per keg. And then subsequently, people started reducing the dose somewhat empirically and I'm not sure that that's an appropriate thing to do. So uh, ethambitol is cleared by the kidneys, and that's something you really have to be careful about because patients with renal dysfunction can accumulate the ethambitol and run into this serious problem with ocular toxicity. So again, if your patient has renal dysfunction or if they're on hemodialysis, you really have to be very, very careful with this drug. Streptomycin is rarely used anymore. Uh, it was the original TB drug. It, along with PAS, was discovered in the early 1940s. Uh, it can be given intramuscularly or intravenously. Uh, the dose range for children is 20, excuse me, 15 to 30 milligrams per kilogram. Adults usually start with 15, but again, children having more total body water, you might want to start at least with 20 um, megs per keg as far as the dose of this drug. And the similar dosing would be true for amicacin and for canamycin. It's cleared almost exclusively by the kidneys, so renal failure patients, you must be careful. Ototoxicity, and there's two types. There's hearing loss and there's vestibular toxicity are concerns uh, in patients receiving aminoglycosides. Nephrotoxicity does occur, though at least with the once daily or intermittent regimens used for TB, it doesn't seem to be nearly the problem as it can be in uh, patients in the intensive care unit. And you can get magnesium, potassium, and calcium loss in your patients, so it's easy enough to check a chem panel periodically. You have to correct the magnesium first if you're going to correct the calcium and the potassium. That's something to keep in mind. Here are the other injectable drugs. The first two are true aminoglycosides. Capriomycin has the same toxicity and the same pharmacokinetics, so we throw it in the same pot, but it's actually a polypeptide. It's chemically distinct from the others. And that's useful because you often have activity by capriomycin in the face of streptomycin resistance and usually in the face of amicacin resistance in vitro. Turning to the fluoroquinolones, levofloxacin is one of the two that we use most commonly. 
it's cleared almost exclusively by the kidney. So the same caveat as with the aminoglycosides and with um, thamethol, you have to be very careful with this drug in renal failure. It can be given orally and intravenously. It's very well absorbed orally. The dose is not a subtle matter for, for children, but in an upcoming paper, which I hope will be published shortly, uh, we're looking at a dose of up to 20 milligrams per kilogram for children. So on a meg per keg basis, it's higher than adults, but based on our previous discussion, that's exactly what you'd expect would be needed. Um, but clearly more study is needed for levofloxacin in children. Moxifloxacin really doesn't have a lot of good pediatric data. The adult dose is 400 milligrams per kilogram. You could choose to make, excuse me, 400 milligrams daily. You could choose to make a milligram per kilogram conversion to pediatric doses, but that would be empiric, and we really don't have a lot of data to support that that would be an adequate dose for children. So again, if you felt compelled to use moxifloxacin in a child, uh, that might be a good situation to do therapeutic drug monitoring to make sure you're achieving concentrations that are uh, considered normal for the adult. The advantage of moxifloxacin is that it's cleared both renally and hepatically. So if you had a patient in renal failure, this might be preferred to levofloxacin because it always has another way out. It has the liver to get out of the body. Like levofloxacin, it can cause CNS effects, it can cause stomach upset, it can cause tendonitis, and more than levofloxacin, it causes QTC prolongation. Now normally, uh, that's not a big problem, and the prolongation is not that profound, rarely, and that's why I have this in parentheses, rarely it can be associated with cardiac dysrhythmias. Usually in a patient with a lot of uh, preconditions that expose the patient to a higher risk, or other medications that also cause QTC prolongation. So that's something to be aware of, but for the most part, you're not going to have to worry about that in pediatric settings. Ethionamide is actually better tolerated by children than it is by adults. The main intolerance is GI upset, and not uncommonly in adults, it causes emesis. So it's really not a fun drug to take. It also can cause hypothyroidism, especially if it's used with paraminosalicylic acid. There's not tons of published experience in children, but a reasonable dose is 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram Divide it twice daily if you can possibly give it twice daily, and I know that's a challenge on an outpatient basis, but a lot of these weak second-line drugs, they're better given twice daily than they are once daily. Paraminosalicylic acid, or PAS, just mentioned, uh, it is usually given as the patient granules in most countries, not all, but it's certainly in the United States, and these are little granules that you should not chew. You just pour them in your mouth and then swallow with a liquid or uh, mix them with yogurt and then swallow that down, but you don't chew these little granules. Uh, the standard adult dose is listed here as four grams twice a day or three times a day. Most people cannot get around to three times a day dosing, so twice daily, I would say, is the rule. This is the proposed dose for children. There's a lot of older experience with PAS in children in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, when it was one of the only three drugs available. Um, this is presumed to be a reasonable dose for children, but again, not a lot of recent published experience uh, with PAS in children. It's metabolized, and the metabolites go out in the kidneys. Um, it seems to be reasonably safe, even in patients who have decreased renal function. So you probably need to give those people at least one dose per day uh, the toxicities are GA offset, sometimes diarrhea, and hypothyroidism. Cyclosterine is a challenging drug to use because it causes central nervous system toxicity. Um, the good news there is that we know it gets into the brain, so you might consider it in a patient who has meningitis. The difficulty, of course, is that if they started getting CNS changes, it would be very difficult to know if it was the cyclosterine or the progression of the meningitis that's causing this uh, problem. So it, it's not the easiest drug to use. It's generally reserved for drug-resistant cases. Standard daily dosing, or you know, the standard dose is 250 to 500 milligrams, typically twice daily. I know that some people give it once daily, 
but uh, there's really not a lot of published experience with such an infrequent dose. So for children, it's proposed, but not much published data, that you give 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram, ideally twice daily. Cyclosterine is cleared by the kidneys, and so we have to be careful of accumulation of this drug in those patients. Now let's take a step back and consider what we're trying to achieve with the antibiotics. And for every drug with a proven mechanism of action, this involves the drug entering the organism, binding to a target, and producing an inhibitory or lethal effect. So if this binding to the target doesn't occur, either because the drug got destroyed by the organism's defenses, or it couldn't penetrate into the organism, or it never got to where the organism is hiding, if this binding doesn't take place, nothing happens and the drug doesn't work. So even though it might be susceptible in vitro, in the patient, if this doesn't happen, it's effectively resistant. Now, for every drug that we give either orally or parenterally, the only way for the drug to reach the organism or bug is through the bloodstream. So if it's not in the blood, it's not in the bug. It's that simple. And this is where the pharmacokinetic piece comes into play. We trust that when we give the standard doses, that all these things of drug delivery and drug entry into the organism and binding are going to occur. But we're trusting, we're hoping that that's going to be the case. Often it is, but it's not always. And we'll talk about the exceptions. So pharmacokinetics, or PK, is the study of the movement of the drug through the body. It's what the body does to the drug. And usually we're looking at serum concentrations. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does, in this case, to the bug. So it's how the drug does its work. And it's the study of these relationships, and we look at them in vitro, or in animal models, or in human clinical trials with dose escalation. And while the TB drugs did have human clinical trials, most of them did not have dose escalation. So if somebody made a semi-arbitrary choice, a priori, did that study, seemed to work, and those are the doses that we still use decades later. Whether or not they're the best doses, that often remains an open question. So here is what I'm talking about as far as pharmacodynamics. There's two things that we're concerned about. The efficacy of the drug, which is the yellow curve, and the toxicity. Now, not every drug we give has concentration-related toxicity. I would say rifampin is an example where this toxicity curve remains very flat for even much higher doses than we currently use, and that is being studied. But other drugs like ethambitol, I've mentioned the ocular toxicity if you overdo it, or rifabutin, uh, neutropenia, or the anterior uveitis if you put too much drug concentration into the patient. So we have to concern ourselves with both the probability of response and the probability of toxicity. For antimicrobials, we measure the pharmacodynamics with one of these three variables. Usually, AUC to MIC is a very good representation. Sometimes the Cmax is a little better, and then sometimes time above MIC is a little better. But most of the time, if you default to choosing AUC to MIC, you're going to be pretty close to where you need to be for most of the TB drugs. So what am I talking about? Well, we're superimposing the serum concentration versus time curve on top of the in vitro MIC. Now, when we're mixing in vivo and in vivo, vitro, that's not ideal, but there is no way to directly measure the MIC in a patient who's under treatment. You, you have to get the organism out of them, and you have to test it in the laboratory, so you're stuck with this MIC being an in vitro measure. And then we can compare this peak right here relative to the MIC, or this area here under the curve divided by the MIC, or that the time from this point to this point the concentrations remain above the MIC. And all of them have some value, and I would say usually AUC to MIC has the most value. Now, there are drugs that we call concentration dependent, and those include the aminoglycosides. Some of you may be old enough to remember, in training anyway, when gentamicin was given 80 milligrams every eight hours. Now it's given four to 500 milligrams, or seven megs per keg, once a day, because we take advantage of concentration dependent killing. You've also noticed that originally levofloxacin was twice daily, and then it moved to once daily, very same reason. 
Unfortunately, the rifamycins were not adequately studied in this regard. But those studies are happening now, and I've already talked about study 29X for rifapentine. The dose changed from either twice a week or once a week at 600 milligrams up to a dose of 1,200 milligrams daily, at least in the adults. So this is a very important concept that's being revisited for all antimicrobials, but in particular now for the TB drugs. And we usually want to get a peak to MIC ratio, which is a little bit more clinically friendly than the AUC, of about uh, 10 to 12 times the MIC. So here's a study that was done by Ludo for Best back in 1969. So this is a study that's older than most of the people listening to this presentation, but the data holds true. So if we look at this, increasing dose in a chronic mouse model of tuberculosis, once they get up to 40 milligrams per kilogram, they essentially sterilize the mice. And this is exactly what we would want to do in people. And it turns out that the pharmacokinetics in mice are reasonably similar to the pharmacokinetics in humans. So it's not because of some wildly different pharmacokinetics that they got this result. But this is the dose that we currently use in humans. And as in the mice, we still have lots of organisms, uh, certainly after 10 weeks in humans. Uh, we have lots and lots of organisms sometimes out for months in humans. So it would suggest that we need to revisit the dose of our family. Here's a cute mouse model. Not that the mice are cute, but it's an acute mouse model done by JRM and colleagues, much more recently, published in 2003. But they show the same kind of a thing. So that this is sort of the 10 milligram per kilogram dose, and this is the exposure that they got. And you can see it's barely more active than giving nothing at all. And it's not until you get to much, much higher doses in drug exposures that rifampin really becomes an extremely potent drug. We'll return to rifapentine and what was mentioned earlier about study 29X. In study 29X, when they changed the dose to 1,200 milligrams daily, with food, and that was seven days a week in that study, the people with the highest rifapentine exposures, that is AUC, or area under the concentration versus time curve, had the best results. And this is exactly what those two mouse models that I just showed you would predict, because rifapentine is cyclopentyl rifampin, and the business end of the molecule rifapentine is identical to the business end of rifampin's uh, molecule. So again, returning to this concentration versus uh, response, we want to maximize the therapeutic effect while minimizing the toxicity of these drugs. And there are clinical data to show that this is important. I'll just present one study here, which is now a 10-year-old study. So this is not a late breaker at this point. And this was a study in HIV-positive TB patients getting an intermittent rifabutin-based regimen. And unfortunately, during this study, and much to our chagrin, and it was not planned, we started selecting out for rifamycin-resistant tuberculosis. And that is really, really undesirable. Now, there was a little discussion at the beginning when the parent study was published. There was a focus on the CD4 count being um, associated with the worst outcome. So the, lowest the CD, lower the CD4 count, the worse the outcome. But that really just turn, turned out to be a marker for poor absorption of rifabutin. So you have the red guys who did really poorly. And not only did they fail or relapse, but they had acquired rifamycin resistance, which for all intents and purposes is MDRTB. Uh, and then the guys in the blue, those guys did fine. Now, some of them had low concentrations and got away with it. And one guy had high concentrations and didn't get away with it. But that's exactly what we saw in that uh, response curve thing. It's a probability, right? So there's always some guy who's not going to respond, and there's always some guy who's going to respond to even small doses or concentrations of the drug. But on the whole, you don't want your patients to have these low concentrations. Happily, now, outside of a protocol where we could not change doses, in your clinic, if you're using rifabutin, you can measure the concentrations, typically three and seven hours after the dose. And if you have somebody in the red zone, you can put them in the blue zone so that you don't get acquired rifamycin resistance. Just to point out the variability of the kinetics and how children differ from adults, here is the volume of distribution, and here is the clearance of a And focus on the third column here. 
And you can see how the volume numbers and the clearance numbers are very different for children than adults. And what does that mean? It means, oops, let's go back one slide. It means that when you look at the concentration versus time curve, the upper three curves are different populations of adults, and these are the children. So clearly, they were getting the wrong dose. And this was normalized here to 20 milligrams per kilogram. So ethanopatol can be a tricky drug, and it's not unreasonable to consider checking serum concentrations in your patient, especially if they're a, um, a heavy child or a very young child or a child that's having a lot of trouble swallowing the extemporaneous dosage forms, anything that makes that child an exception to the rule, I would consider measuring the drug. Now, there are many reasons for slow responses, and slow responses are very common, and we'll look at that on the very next slide. Obviously, if the patient has an adverse reaction and you have to stop the drugs, it's going to take longer. If the patient leaves the treatment program for a while, they're going to take longer to treat. But in our experience, there's a substantial portion of tr uh, trouble that comes from low drug exposure. Now, the annual slide set for the CDC shows this slide, and you know, the years keep marching out. But you can see that this looks like an asymptotic process. It's like zooming in on some kind of plateau. And things were not so, so great in 1993, which was the high point of the incidence of the resurgence of TB in the United States. And it's gotten better. But notice two things. First, this is 88%. It's not 95 or 98%. And secondly, it's at one year. It's not at six months. Right? So while this is good, and we eventually get up to 95% of the patients to complete therapy, it's not six months, and it's not 98%. Right? So the standard claim is that we have a six-month regimen that does what I just said, 98% success, 3% relapse, which we don't explicitly track in the United States, for about 95% overall cure. Now, you can certainly achieve this, but if you look at the original studies, this was per protocol under research conditions. So what does that mean? That means that up to 10, sometimes even 20% of the patients either didn't qualify for the study or they dropped out. So they were not included in the analysis. Now, if you had that kind of patient in your clinic, they're still in your clinic. You can't say, well, I'm sorry, you're not per protocol, get out of my clinic. You still have to treat them. So it's highly unlikely they will ever get these kinds of numbers in a routine clinic situation because you have to take all comers. So what percentage of USTB patients complete the six-month regimen in six months? And the answer is 18%. That might be a shockingly low number for some of you. Now, you may clearly argue, well, you know, what if they took six months and one week because of bureaucratic reasons, paper trailing reasons, where they couldn't get their prescriptions right away? Okay, let's be fair and let's use the seventh month instead of the sixth month time point. Well, it's still 45%. That's not 95%. That's less than half of what you might otherwise expect. So clearly, there's something going on. Now, the bulk of this data are adult data, so I stress that. There's some pediatric data in here, but it's predominantly adult data. And children, especially if they have minimal disease with Tyler adenopathy, they tend to do really well. But there are other cases which are actually excluded from this data set with miliary disease and meningitis, again, excluded from this data set. Those are much more serious cases. So this is supposed to be a six-month regimen, but it can take a year to get 88% of the people to be completed in their therapy, and it can take up to 18 months in some cases. And so that would be like giving three courses, and of course you're paying for that. You're paying for them to be on three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back courses of tuberculosis, if you will. Now, turning to the toxicity side of things, it is not possible to give drugs with the explicit purpose of avoiding toxicity. If you're going to give the drugs, you have to accept that you're going to get some toxicity in some of your patients. So there's no guarantee. If you really want a guarantee of no toxicity, don't give the drug. If you find that you're forced to give the drug, you're going to have to accept this probability. And that was the lower curve on that probability versus concentration curve that I showed you twice already. 
So you're going to have to deal with this. The best way, from my standpoint, to avoid toxicity is to give the most effective dose for the shortest possible time. Now, what we do for some of our cases here, and uh, I would suggest is available at several laboratories in the United States and in Europe, is you can consider therapeutic drug monitoring for any number of your patients. And the decision to use therapeutic drug monitoring is the same as the decision to get a CBC with diff or to get a CAT scan or an MRI. None of these will guarantee the treatment outcome. What it allows you to do is make an informed decision. Am I delivering the drug? Am I delivering enough drug? Do I need to change the dose to get as much drug into the patient as I really want in the patient? That's what this allows you to do. And to quote our former president, actually, I never heard him speak Russian, but I did hear Ronnie Reagan say, trust but verify. It sounded more like, trust but verify. More like that. At any rate, that's what we try to do, make sure that we're giving the right doses. And I'd like to just uh, close by thanking the folks in the laboratory who actually measure the concentrations, and those would be these chemists. Uh, Jessica has recently left us for the FDA, so congratulations to Jessica. Uh, if you call our laboratory, you're going to be talking to Roger Sedlicek. Here are some current or, gra or, or recent graduate students and current or uh, recent students who have done some data collection. And with me today is Alicia Wiggins, who's our current student who is working on uh, data collection for our laboratory. So with that, I thank you for your attention and have a very good day.